A lake is a very beautiful thing, and as we all know, Minnesota has well over 10,000. But as beautiful and precious as they are, and economically valuable, and despite the many tens to hundreds of millions of dollars we spend annually attempting to take care of them and save them, our lakes are in a great deal of difficulty. Almost 50% of Minnesota's lakes are now impaired, and almost 10% have aquatic invasive species. So as a scientist, I ask myself, what are we doing wrong, and what might we do better? The problem, I believe, after having spent several decades trying to understand this problem, is that we fundamentally failed to recognize the biological principles that underlie healthy lakes and their fish. We've had trouble, as visual beings, focusing on the water surface and not what's underneath it, where all the action actually occurs. Because the below the surface of a lake, you'll find a dynamic and complex web of hundreds of species of microbes, plants, algae, fish, that are all highly interconnected and interacting, dying, living, eating each other, and growing. And this web is constantly shifting in ways that we frankly don't totally understand. But as it shifts, it changes. And you can end up in a situation very easily where it gets out of balance. Too many plants, for instance, or too few large fish. But the connections change, and they lead to new alternative stable states, new balance points. And once they shift and the lake changes, it can get stuck in this stable state. So once they get stuck, it's a common alternative state that lakes end up in, is having too many floating microscopic algae that shield out submerged plants. And then you can't have habitat for fish, and you enter a stable state that you can't get back from. So for those of us who want to save lakes or study them and understand them, we really have to look at the dynamics of what underlies these stable states. So I'll just take a moment and talk about what we understand about that. But science, after about 50 years of work now, has basically identified five factors that drive stable states in lakes. The first factor is nutrients. Nutrients, such as phosphorus and other chemicals, traditionally came from the lake itself and its waters, but now they're coming from runoff, lakeshore homes, agriculture, roadbeds, all kinds of sources. And this is particularly insidious because they build up in sediments in ways that they cannot wash out. People spend entire careers, chemists, trying to understand how the nutrients bind to sediments and how to get them out. The point is they're there for decades, and once it shifts, you end up with an interconnected uh, alternative state. The second major factor is temperature. Changing temperature and loss of thermal refuges in lakes can have dramatic effects on fish and water quality. This is not always intuitive to people because we're visual and we're warm-blooded, but fish are cold-blooded. Everything living in lakes is cold-blooded. They've evolved to do well in certain temperature ranges, and these ranges are now shifting, so they can't do as well. In this figure, from a paper by Gretchen Hansen, you can see how that green bar at the top, which represents walleye, a cool water fish, unless something happens in our neighbor's state of Wisconsin, the walleye will be lost at the expense of largemouth bass over the next few decades, solely because of warming waters. The third major factor that you have to keep in mind is habitat. This is much more intuitive to people because usually we can see it. Lakeshore development, the lakes are experiencing wholesale changes in their shorelines and the plants and animals that live along the edges. Of course, this means that things are losing the places where they live, and this leads to unhealthy balances and changes in habitat, which of course facilitate the arrival of invasive species. The fourth major factor I wanted to talk about today briefly was large predators, fish in particular. Historically, our lakes since the last glaciation have been dominated by large old fish. This is how and why these systems work the way they do. It's what we treasure about them. But in the last century, another large predator has arrived, ourselves. Fish that our grandparents used to catch are now mostly gone, and stocking small fish has just not kept up. This is a pervasive problem because the continual removal of large fish results in new evolutionary trajectories that favor smaller, meeker, less fecund fish. So it leads to another kind of alternative stable state. And finally, the one that people are most concerned about now, and rightly so, is aquatic invasive species. We're changing the species compositions of our lakes.
and we're doing so partly because of our movements and partly because our habitats are changing. What's insidious about this is that aquatic invasive species are often what's known as environmental engineers. They remake the entire ecosystems to their own desire, thereby creating another alternative state that in which natives maybe don't do well. And this is a picture of common carp, which arrived in our water some 140 years ago, which totally turn ecosystems upside down, and just now, 140 years later, we're starting to get a grasp on. Our lakes and their health and their fisheries are pretty much uh, determined by five major factors. These factors are highly interconnected and work as webs within these systems, where they influence each other and they influence themselves, and they drive primarily the things that we really care about, water clarity and fisheries. And all of these factors, are driven by ourselves as well in rather complicated ways, but everybody is involved with this. And when you look at it a little more closely, as a biologist, it gets particularly daunting because you realize that normally more than one factor is being disturbed in most lakes. In this figure, I've, I've sort of symbolized here a lake in which uh, aquatic invasive species, AIS, temperature, and uh, predator population are being impacted. And you can see by the red arrows how they all influence each other in a web-like effect. And even though the fisheries may be managed properly, there will be a resulting impact on fisheries. And of course, each lake will have a different set of scenarios. This overwhelming problem has typically led, understandably, to a focus on one or two factors in a lake at most. An extremely piecemeal approach. This means that it can't work. Controlling one factor alone just can't work. It's all interconnected, it's all part of a whole. Successful lake management will have to evolve to something new that addresses all five factors simultaneously in a holistic fashion. So how might we do that? I think there's only two possible options. One would be more and better technology. This is where people, such, including scientists myself, typically gravitate to. But if you look at the history of this and the, and the challenge in front of us, it's a little bit daunting. This is where we've already heavily invested. We're spending tens of millions of dollars a year already in new sewage treatment plants, alum treatments, habitat restoration, fish stocking programs, boat inspections, plant eradication programs. It goes on and on. And there's no question, it's helping. But to be honest, if you really look at it, is it doing the job? Out of almost 4,000 impaired lakes in Minnesota, only 35 in the last 20 or so years have been taken off the impaired species list, and not one lake has been eradicated for aquatic invasive species. This is an unfortunate reality. We just simply do not have the science, time, or money to keep up with the continual avalanche of pressures being put on these lakes. We have to look for something new. The other option might be conservation. If we could identify, through new conservation science and policies, particular segments of lakes that were particularly valuable and conserve them, the lake and those pieces of areas might preserve themselves in a holistic fashion which all five factors are automatically addressed and in a way that makes sense and allows nature to work for itself. Furthermore, if we could identify key areas that were anchored into the entire ecosystem, they might benefit the entire system. Well, I'd like to say this was my great idea, but it's not at all. Because 50 years ago, marine scientists came to exactly the same conclusion. In 1960s, marine managers whose systems are really not that different, by the way, than freshwater, it's just that you can see through them, so people realized what was going on a lot earlier, realized that these same five factors were the ones that were destroying coral reefs, fisheries, uh, wetlands, et cetera. And they came to the conclusion that the only reasonable solution, the only real hope, in the short term anyway, was to establish a set of marine protected areas. These areas can take many forms, and they basically involve reserving certain pieces of water in certain ways to protect them in some fashion. And they're always locally managed to meet local needs and local ecosystem needs. Well, it's been a huge success. There's almost 14,000 marine protected areas across the globe. Uh, almost 5% of the world's oceans are now protected with them, and there's a target to increase this to almost 10,000. 
importantly, not only have these marine protected areas improved entire ecosystems, but they've greatly improved many fisheries. And the reasons are pretty simple. They're what I said before. Basically, if you allow fish and other organisms to survive and thrive and reproduce the way they originally evolved, guess what? They tend to do pretty well. In this little example I'll show you here, a small area of Banana Creek Reserve, it's called, just outside Cape Canaveral, was set aside in the early 70s. Um, and within a decade, that entire system extending all the way down to Cape Canaveral not only had much higher quality water and ecosystems, but the fisheries recovered considerably with tenfold increases in key game fish and world record captures of also the black drum, another major fish in that area. They were spilling out of these areas, they were reproducing them, they spill out and they benefit the entire area. What I've asked myself is why not apply these principles of conserving key selected areas to fresh water? They're equally valuable, they're equally delicate, they're equally important. Why not apply that? I'm proposing to establish uh, freshwater conservation areas in the state of Minnesota and hopefully beyond that. These areas would conserve key parts of lakes and rivers and maybe entire lakes in certain cases in a holistic and relatively inexpensive way that would get the job done and give science a chance to catch up, maybe to restore some of these areas because it's going to take a lot of work. We'll need new science to do this, to identify the important factors and some new policies, but it's a fairly straightforward process. We already have a good start on many of these. These freshwater conservation areas would include things like easements to deal with nutrients, habitat protection in, in, in the water itself. They would play key roles, saving our lakes beauty and value, protect our heritage for future generation. I really believe it's time for a new, new approach and that this is a very realistic and needed facet. There are lakes, there are resources. We're the ones, through all those five factors that I've described, that have, that have really driven things to where they are now. I believe it's time to realize the reality of it and take it back and start to bring this situation under control with these freshwater conservation areas. And a uh, foundation has been established to uh, take that step forward because there's no agency that can deal with this holistic approach at this time. And if you're interested, I would refer you to that uh, website listed at the end there. Thank you for your time.